This is Greg Orloff with IIoT World, and we are here for an interview. Therese Grebel is going to be interviewing Dr. Harrison Schmidt, who is the Apollo 17 astronaut and last man to walk on the moon. So I'm going to turn it over to these folks to begin their interview. So I'm Therese Grebel, recently retired from NASA headquarters in the Space Technology Mission Directorate. And I have the pleasure of being able to interview uh, Harrison Schmidt, who is the man, the legend. Um, and it is quite an honor to, to meet you and to actually get an opportunity to talk to you. Well, it's great to be with you, Therese. And uh, I, I hope that legend thing is uh, left for the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. I'm sure it will continue to be. So um, you're going to be the keynote speaker, speaker this year at uh, Energy Tech 2019. And uh, my first question to you really is, uh, you're a scientist uh, with a PhD in geology from Harvard. You are an astronaut, not just any run-of-the-mill astronaut, as if there is a run-of-the-mill astronaut. You're an astronaut who actually walked on the moon and piloted uh, hardware in Apollo. You uh, were a previous assistant administrator at NASA headquarters on energy programs. You are a U.S. Senator for uh, the state of New Mexico, and apparently you have the nickname of Jack. And so how would you like for me to refer to you? Well, I think Harrison's probably better. Uh, more people know me that way, I think, now. And okay, very good. Look, look forward to chatting with you. Wonderful. So Harrison, uh, working for NASA for me was such a thrill uh, and an honor. I had many opportunities to work on exciting programs that were challenging and how we refer to it as NASA hard. But you got to work at NASA. How did you start at NASA and what did you do at NASA? Well, I, I started because NASA and the National Academy of Sciences asked for volunteers for the first selection of scientists astronauts. This was in 1964, late 1964. And I uh, went through the process that the Academy put together for selecting uh, a number of uh, astronauts, turned out to be 16 candidates to uh, be evaluated first by a physical at Brooks Air Force Base, and then by NASA through interviews. Uh, it, was a, it was a fairly long process, but somehow or another, six of us got through it. Wow, it's phenomenal. How was it to work at NASA during the Apollo era? It was a very exciting time. You're, for somebody in their early 30s, like I was at the time, I was working with young people in their 20s, uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. It, people don't realize just how young NASA was in the Apollo days, and I think that was one of, of a few very critical factors in the success of Apollo was having young people who uh, didn't know how to fail yet. They, they had the stamina and the patriotism, motivation, uh, and uh, to continue to work until the job was done. Uh, nobody believed it couldn't be done. Uh, it just, there were uh, a lot of challenges to be met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sim similar, I would say, probably to today's challenges to accomplishing some of the nation's priorities at NASA and in energy in general, right? Well, I think it is very similar uh, in terms of the overall atmosphere, but the environment, the management environment of NASA is very different. The, uh, the country is very different because of the uh, growth of commercial space enterprises. Instead of uh, producing new technologies or at least advancing technologies to accomplish the Apollo challenge that John Kennedy and, in a, in a sense, before him, even Eisenhower uh, gave us, uh, that uh, today, it's, uh, it's, it's really adapting all the new technologies that have been created since Apollo uh, to a new uh, set of challenges. Uh, it is a, uh, and, and NASA really needs to, I think, to examine that Apollo management environment and see what portions of it need to be adapted to the current time. NASA is an older agency. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, commercial sector is far younger for the most part. That NASA is, and those are just uh, two of the, the challenges NASA has in front of it. Well, can they be met? Yes, of course they can. I am very optimistic that this can uh, all be done, uh, but uh, it does represent some, as I've said, challenges for NASA uh, today that uh, were different than those that we faced uh, for Apollo. So after your legendary walk on the moon and, your, and the Apollo missions were, were over, 
you were asked to be the assistant administrator for energy programs at NASA headquarters. Um, what were the challenges at that time in energy and power systems that the agency had and that the nation and other agencies had and what the nation was facing? Well, when George Lowe and uh, Jim Fletcher asked me to come to headquarters in 1973, actually 74, uh, to uh, organize and run an energy program office, uh, we were in the middle of a, an energy crisis at the time. We didn't have nearly the uh, oil and gas production that we have today. Uh, we were importing most of a uh, great deal of our energy resources. And, and there was an emphasis, at least in NASA, on trying to increase the efficiency of energy conversion and the efficiency of energy production. And we uh, thought, uh, George Lowe and I thought, that maybe uh, we could persuade other government agencies to adapt some of the NASA technologies that came out of Apollo to those challenges that they had in terms of energy production and energy conversion. Uh, that was the primary purpose of the office. I see. And so um, I think what I've experienced at NASA is that in both aeronautics and in space applications, we are developing advanced technologies for energy, for power conversion, power management and distribution systems. And as they're developed for these, these uh, applications, generally those technologies advance to a point where they benefit terrestrially our nation and the rest of the world. And um, do you see that as still occurring? Or do you see with commercial space and commercial industry uh, that there's maybe a, a flipping of the, the roles with respect to that? Well, I, I think the roles are very different. They're much broader, they're more diverse than they were at the time that uh, we were uh, thinking about applying Apollo technology to these kinds of problems. Uh, and the uh, commercial sector has advanced uh, technology uh, way beyond what uh, we had at that time. So the challenges really are different and the opportunities are different as well. Uh, today, the nation is largely independent in oil and gas production. That's extremely important foundation on which we can stand as we look and see what other technologies may be uh, cost effective for use in the future. I'm not sure we're there yet. In fact, uh, when I was running the uh, program office for NASA, uh, the energy program office for NASA, uh, we were working with windmills, wind turbines now, they tend to call them, uh, and uh, batteries. Uh, a, whole, a variety of other uh, applications, solar conversion, and, and we were having a heck of a time getting the efficiency and the reliability of these systems to the point of where we thought they might ultimately be commercial. I think that's still there today. Uh, when uh, turbines are not necessarily commercially uh, uh, viable, they're being subsidized still in many respects. Uh, the biofuels area it still has some subsidies in it. Uh, so you can't say they're truly commercial until those technologies have uh, really matured to the point of where they are competitive uh, with the foundation technology, and that is uh, still fossil fuels. The power grid uh, requires uh, power, uh, fossil fuels, coal, as well as nuclear in order to to provide a stable environment for these new technologies to develop. Most of the new so-called renewable technologies uh, are not truly renewable and they require storage in order to be cost effective. And the storage right now is being provided by the national grid. I'm not saying that these things can't be improved in the future, but nevertheless, uh, we still have some major challenges in moving uh, society away uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, we'll be using fossil fuels for a long time particularly in transportation and in providing a stable national grid. Now, in the long term, as you probably are aware, I've been working with uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin as well as uh, some individual private investors uh, to see if we can't uh, bring helium-3 back to the moon uh, to provide a very, very uh, uh, cost-effective, we think, and certainly very efficient form of fusion power that can gradually replace some of the baseload power that uh, now is supplied almost entirely by coal and nuclear power. Right, right, very, very exciting. So 
What do you see are the bigger challenges that we face as we try to advance um, our abilities in this nation and in the world for solving terrestrial power system issues? Are they political? Are they technical? Are they societal? I think they're mostly political uh, because uh, we do have uh, known ways of producing energy for uh, terrestrial needs, pr principally from fossil fuels, but also nuclear uh, systems uh, as well. Uh, right now, though, the political uh, part of the political spectrum is trying to accelerate our uh, departure from the use of fossil fuels, and that's just not going to happen, in my opinion. It, you just can't afford that. The economy can't afford it. People can't afford it. And uh, it's going to take a lot longer to bring these new energy sources into a competitive position uh, for the economy than uh, a lot of people on the political spectrum are, are tending to advocate. Mm -hmm. Do you see any opportunities for, uh, you know, I mean, things are changing dramatically, as you said, NASA used to be, NASA started as the place, the only place where we could actually develop the power and propulsion systems and the other systems necessary to send humans, say, to the moon. Um, now we see the emergence of, of technical markets in the United States and across the world where NASA is maybe not, it's not, it is not the only place where we're going to be able to leverage capability. Relative to power systems, do you see opportunities that uh, will, will ultimately maybe circumvent some of the political uh, forces that might be trending us towards in the wrong direction for solving some of our power and energy needs? Well, the private sector is, uh, has a remarkable ability to uh, come up with new ways, more efficient ways, uh, more cost-effective ways uh, to solve some of these energy problems. Just one example is the uh, work that is now reasonably public that uh, TAE Technologies in California has been uh, developing pretty much under the radar, and that is fusion again. And it's not fusion that is based on a, a deuterium-tritium fusion cycle, as we call them, uh, but one in which uh, it's what we call aneutronic, that is neutrons are not produced by these uh, new fusion technologies. And the neutrons are the bad actors. They're what create the nuclear waste uh, that uh, caused so uh, many political as well as technical difficulties uh, to dispose of or to tr uh, transmute or change into useful products. Uh, that, uh, but TAE has made a lot of progress in uh, developing these aneutronic systems uh, for fusion. And uh, I think they, and that's entirely with private investment. And so that uh, I think is a, uh, uh, maybe one of the uh, foundations for the future is private individuals putting their uh, resources into the development of new energy systems that are competitive within the uh, existing economy. So one other question I have for you is, when I was working in aeronautics at headquarters, um, we, for political reasons, we were not we were not motivated, we were not even allowed to really partner with our European uh, comrades relative to advancing electrical power systems, advancing power density of materials, advancing high energy, efficient energy storage systems, et cetera, as we would apply them to, say, hybrid electric aircraft or other applications. And uh, there were political reasons for that, and I understand them, but do you see um, a better opportunity for us to be partnering worldwide, or are there opportunities for us to engage with and leverage capabilities across, not just within the United States, but worldwide? I think there are uh, such opportunities, uh, but you have to be very careful in how they're uh, put together and, and what kind of a management system you set up. Uh, somebody has to lead, somebody has to be making the final decisions. Uh, that's the primary difficulty of international partnerships. That yeah. It's very difficult to have a single uh, nation uh, in the driver's seat. But if you're going to get things done and get them done efficiently and in a hurry sometimes, you have to have somebody who is in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that actually in Apollo. Apollo provided a capability for international scientists, at least, uh, to participate. 
in uh, lunar exploration as well as other aspects of space exploration. Uh, but it was the, the Apollo was the foundation for doing that. The uh, international community participated primarily in, on the science side of things. Uh, the Apollo spacecraft provided the platform for new scientific experiments, both in space and on the surface of the moon. A uh, very important international partnership. But nevertheless, the United States was in the lead position to make that happen. And I think that has to be the case as we go forward. It's going to be very difficult to have uh, joint decisions being made in what is still a very risky business, and that is operating in deep space. Uh, the risks of deep space have not disappeared. Our techniques for managing those risks have changed to some degree, but though we still have to manage them. And uh, th th those risks are not going to go away. It's still Deep space is still a very dangerous place to be. Near-Earth space has changed somewhat. It is now relatively routine to get there. It doesn't mean there aren't risks in getting there, as we see every once in a while. But still, uh, deep space is pretty much like it was for Apollo. Well, Harrison, it is really great to meet you. And I'm very excited that you're coming to Cleveland for the Energy Tech 2019 conference. I look forward to meeting you in person. And I hope to get to be able to talk to you more about some of these topics and others as we move forward. Well, I hope we can. I'm looking forward to my visit uh, very, very much. And uh, it'll be good to see some old friends again. Excellent. Thank you very much.